I'd like to call the Board of Education meeting for Wednesday, May 8th, 2013 to order. Can we have a roll call, please, Mrs. Schleter? Sure, Mr. Alexandrovich. Here. Mrs. Evans. Here. Mrs. Klein. Here. Mrs. Larson. Here. Mr. Nielsen. Here. Mrs. Witkowski. Here. And I am here. Thank you. Has the meeting been properly posted, Dr. Betts? Yes. Thank you. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Uh, per board policy, we allow up to 15 minutes of resident comment. Would anyone like to make a comment tonight? Good evening. Congratulations to those newly elected or re-elected officials. Welcome to the school board and the school district of Franklin. And um, I'm here on behalf of several of the EAs in our district and myself. So I come tonight to tell you a story. It is my story of my wonderful experience as an employee of Franklin Public Schools. When I began my career at the high school not long ago, I was asked to provide assistance to 18 students who were considered at risk of failing. <clears throat> I job shared with another EA who had a similar group of students in the mornings. Most of the students who I assisted were sophomores or juniors, but I also had a few freshmen. The job consisted of encouraging these students to complete and turn in past due work, provide a review assistance for tests, or advocating for the students with their teachers. I was expected to track their grades, provide each student with a weekly summary of missing work, as well as submit a weekly <coughs> Excel report to the associate principal, noting the student's grades, work completion, and comments on their study efforts. In addition, I was the after-school library aide, so I was trained to help students and staff in locating and checkout of materials, <coughs> running interference with technology, the copy and laminating machines, and processing new library materials. I also assisted special needs students during math testing throughout that first year. Like in any new job, I was exposed to many challenges. Classroom management was the most difficult thing for me to manage that first year. When children are not your own, dealing with behavior of other people's children can be most frustrating. <coughs> but by seeking advice of other professional staff, I managed to get cooperation from and even had fun with my charges. The other challenges uh, the other challenge was the <coughs> weekly reporting that I had to submit. Most of that work was done on my own time, as I had no allotted time at work to complete those tasks. While improvements of study, student study skills was a large part of my work, I also had the opportunity to go back to school. I was stimulated by new information about many things that had been discovered after I graduated high school and even college. It was great to be exposed to all this information and made the change in my job the following year to classroom EA very exciting for me. For the last three years, I have worked with students in algebra and the new freshman integrated math, basic and advanced chemistry and biology, freshman and advanced English, basic computer skills, word, world and US history, senior health, art, and even woods. I continue to assist in math testing, work with special needs students in their study skills, and provide assistance to at-risk students during morning resource and on Thursday mornings during late start. Lastly, I have helped to proctor ACT tests, supervise hallways during pep rallies, provide assistance with forms and fees days and graduation, substitute in the library, provide meals for the college reps for the high school college fair, and act as a timer and announcer for swim meets. I provided you with a summary of my duties because the work that I do is important work. 
I have had teachers thank me for helping the students in their classrooms, making those classes easier for them to manage. More importantly, I know that I make a difference because I have had students and their parents thank me for my efforts and tell me that I help them to meet graduation requirements or overcome their performance issue. Without your help, Mrs. K, I would not have finished, is something that I've heard from a number of students. These words makes my job worth it all. And while I am not a miracle worker, I feel that my presence add val adds value to our schools and helps our students achieve their personal best. That being said, I would like to make you aware of a situation that affects me and six other EAs. When I began employment with FPS, compensation for my cohort group was based on years of experience in the system. My cohort group had steps, three in all, to allow for increases in compensation. Steps were uh, value-added compensation increases based on years of service and experience earned in the job to help retain good employees. With the passage of Act 10, we seven were denied our compensation steps increase, which, in essence, affects current and future compensation. Personally, I earn approximately $2,000 less than other EAs at the top of the scale who have the same or similar responsibilities with no means of earning professional development credit to boost my compensation. Most EAs are part-time employees, so we can't earn overtime pay, and there has been a reduction in paid holidays. Thus, any future compensation increases will be paid on a lower base wage than those EAs who are at the top of the scale. I know that this denial may have been an oversight, but it essentially makes me and the six other educational assistants second-class citizens. I know that districts across the state are under no obligation to entertain anything but basic wage increases. However, having served on this board, I know that equity in all matters FPS was a priority. Whether it concerned the qualities of facilities, any new programming to meet the needs of students in academic, sports, or recreational programs, education for the benefit of the board, administrators, or any personnel group, benefits and wages across all groups, including those of administrators. All decisions made were based on equity and what is best for the welfare and well-being of the students and the employees of the district. <coughs> In your deliberations today, I would ask you to consider these facts in your discussion of non-exempt compensation and personnel. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Would anyone else like to make a comment? Hearing none, then we will move on to item four, Friends of Franklin Public Schools recognition. And we have Dr. Patz and Mrs. Schleter. Good evening, everyone, especially our guests that are here tonight to honor some individuals who are extremely valuable to our district. Each month we have our staff nominate people who really go above and beyond to assist our students and staff in performing uh, a lot of duties, and they all assist the students in, in the end of the game. And it's uh, very nice to see some of you here with your families and so on, because I think it's important for others to see and for you to be recognized for all the efforts that you put forth in helping our school district, primarily because you don't have to. And when you do those kinds of things out of your own heart and your interest in our district and in our community, I think it says a lot about you as individuals. So at this time, I'd like to have Mary Pat Seward and Sharon Hushik come forward, first of all. And our first uh, person that was nominated uh, by these two individuals to receive the Friends of Franklin uh, recognition is Beth Bryant. Beth, would you please come forward? From where did you stand? read a little bit of a blurb, but we're going to change it up a little bit, and we're going to have Mary Pat and Sharon in their own words tell why you nominated uh, this individual and what she offers your classes. Well, I'm really excited to, to have worked with Sharon to nominate Beth, because Beth has been an integral part of our fifth and sixth grade science program for the last two years. Um, Beth comes every Tuesday and works currently with our fifth grade students on a project that has renovated the forest behind Ben Franklin on the Ben Franklin grounds. Um, that forest has um, gone under, you know, maybe some disrepair in the last couple of years. And so the students have cleaned it up. Um, they have learned so much about all of the, the trees and the plants and everything in that forest and have created some pretty incredible lessons for the other students in our school. Um, and that has really been under Bev and Sharon's uh, purview. <coughs> Last year, she worked with our current sixth grade when they were in fifth grade to clean up our prairie right behind the school and replanted all of our, our prairie plants and really cleaned that up and made it look like a real prairie and not a mess. 
<laughs> so it's been really great. And I know Sharon has some yeah, things to honor her for. Having teaching, but we learn environments fourth quarter every year in fifth grade. And so to have the environmentals with us every week has just been amazing. I have learned a lot. And the kids, restoring that prairie and the uh, forest, each one of those students has written you a thank you letter, what they appreciate. And what they've gotten out of it is um, tremendous. I, from the kids, the lowest learning, the one who struggles learning to the one who really is into it, what they have gotten out of it, one of our special ed has become our expert in documenting everything we do with the video cameras and cameras. And we have weekly announcements now that we have on our TVs, which we didn't, I didn't know we could do, and we figured out we could do that in teenage schools. And that little things like that, they are never going to forget this, and it's going to be with us for this time. <laughs> and, and she just found out, yes. So, um, I'm doing this because I love what I do, but I'm also doing it as part of my job at Wear Nature Center, so this is really where Nature Center is on and on. But um, we've been working with the school. Uh, last year we received a Wisconsin Environmental Education Board grant that allowed us to send a Nature Center person over to help the students do this and to also pay for the field trips and all sorts of materials and things. And we also, we just found out we received a, about a $10,000 grant for next year. So I get to keep my fifth graders into sixth grade and some new fifth graders and we're very excited about by the neighborhood forest and you'll see some great things. Please take a walk through. come forward. Joanne is one of our outstanding art teachers in the district. And Joanne nominated Bob Bankowski. Bob, would you come forward, please? <coughs> well, gosh, I don't know where to start. We've been working together for several years now over at Pleasant View. But uh, I just want to commend Bob, and I wanted to have him recognized here tonight, not only for what he has done for the art program at Pleasant View. He start, I believe he started out in the library. Is that correct? He was volunteering at the library. And then from there, he's been helping with fundraisers at Pleasant View overall. And now with my program, uh, we have an art fundraiser every year. And Bob has been helping me out uh, with that um, original works program. And by Bob helping out with that, I mean, he takes the initiative. Um, I don't have to even worry about how he's handling the program. He just comes through and and uh, is self-motivated, and we've, um, every year, we've been able to uh, obtain um, funds for uh, art supplies and materials that the kids really would ha not have the advantages with if it wouldn't be for, for Bob helping to provide uh, the necessary uh, manpower and the work behind this uh, fundraising effort. So I just want to thank you so much. Thank you. We much appreciate it. <laughs> Next, I'd like to have one of the more fun-loving teachers we have, Maggie Meyer, come forward. <laughs> I say that uh, Maggie's always got a smile on her face and is always enthusiastic with her kids and so on. And uh, Maggie uh, nominated Penny Murchberger. So, Maggie, yes. would you come forward, please? Pressure, don't know <laughs> <laughs> I'm sweating from all that math that matters today. Um, well, I've known Mrs. Merzberger for um, two years, and I observed her last year in one of the third grade rooms. I was hoping, oh, I hope I get her daughter, Maggie, because then she'd be my volunteer. Um, she comes on a regular basis. She's always willing to do whatever I need done. She's also helping Mrs. Berzik, our reading specialist now, because um, Mrs. Berzik was in need of some help. And um, she's also um, helping the whole school with doing, um, helping with our carnival and um, our raffle baskets and raising money for our school. And talk about a smile. She always comes in. She's very positive and happy. And it's just a um, just very reliable, wonderful person. And I just have here, uh, V is valuable um, for volunteer. V, valuable is the work you do. O, outstanding is how you always come through. L, loyal, sincere, and full of good cheer. You untiring in your efforts throughout the year, and notable are the con contributions you make. 
T, trustworthy in every project you take. E, eager to reach your goal, your every goal. E, effective in the way you fulfill your role. R, ready with a smile like a shining star. Special and wonderful, that's what you are. And thank you for all your time because time is very valuable. And um, I just want to take a little time to say thank you and continue to help our school. <laughs> thank you. And as Dr. Papp said, it's so fun to come in to see Mrs. Smart. She is always smiling. And the kids love her. And so it's a very welcoming environment. So I love you. Get a little nervous when they saw uniformed officers walking. <laughs> you're, you're okay for the night. Next, I'd like to have Daryl Beck to come forward. The one of the relationships the school district has that's really strong is, is the one that we have with our police department. And uh, we, we generally have these uh, two next gentlemen, uh, Bob Barris and Joseph D'Amato, come into our schools and work with our children. And uh, Daryl nominated them. And uh, I can't tell you what an asset they are for our children. And I think they are the type of individuals that come into our schools and have a lasting effect as do our teachers on what they do and how they work with kids. So uh, to both of you, congratulations for being up here. It's good to have you. And Daryl's going to say a few words about you. OK, all right, thanks. And I think uh, I'm sure everybody's been following the news out of Cleveland. You know, um, yesterday and today with the tragedy of those girls being incarcerated for over 10 years. Um, and it's just kind of a reminder of why we're so serious and proud of the program that we do in Franklin with the Protect the Behaviors program, which actually we've been allied with department now for 28 years. Um, a few years ago, we recognized uh, Fred Shank and, and Captain Gruen, who were involved from the onset of the program and had and been with it for 25 years. There's been some retirements, there's been cuts in you know, both uh, the police department and public schools. So these guys have had to um, uh, come and do two grades each. Um, Joe is doing kindergarten and first grade, um, and, and Bob is doing second and third grades. And they're covering the classrooms in in all the schools along with Carmen and, and Beth Hammer, because we've gone to two guys' houses at the elementary to cover all three grades. So they are each um, presenting in front of about 600 children in 24 classrooms um, each every year um, that they're doing this. Bob also had done, and has continued to do here for a number of years, I'm not sure how many, but he's been with the district for a long time in that capacity. Um, and Joe is doing that as well. So these kids, again, see him later on. Um, I do protect behaviors at the higher level of fifth and sixth grade, and I always do a review and remind them of their what they learned along the way, and they clearly remember kindergarten, you know, and all the lessons at that level. It has a really neat uh, impact on the kids to see police officers in a teaching, helpful, you know, kind of mode, and I think that's been a real pride of our, our school district along with the Franklin Police Department. You know, believe it or not, not all police departments get real positive PR on, on the media. Such, but I think in, in this district, we're doing a lot to give kids an impression that they are your friends, they are helping adults. Um, and their, the work that they do, and we never really see, because we don't know when kids did make positive decisions and didn't end up in the kind of situation that, that those girls experienced down in Cleveland. Um, so because of their double duty and um, continued diligent effort, and they're taking up all with other retirements, I want to recognize. While the board is here, Carmen is retiring at the end of this year. If you could stand up, Carmen. <laughs> she's, been a, um, she's been a guidance counselor for 25 years. She's retiring at the end of the year. And um, I'd like to give a uh, Working with these two amazing police officers has been a joy. I know that sounds kind of strange to say that. But they come in, the kids love them. They're mesmerized by what they say, they hang on every word, and it is truly a positive experience for them. And they know the police officers when they come in the building for other reasons. And <laughs> it is, it's a positive, it's a very positive, and I hope it continues for another 50 years, or 100 years. <laughs>
congratulations again to all of you who sacrificed so much of your time for the benefit of our school district. And one of the things Thank that I think that's important to realize, especially with these two guys, and I, I, I walk by and I see them when they're in classes sometimes, they, most of the time they don't know I'm watching, but you know, you have to have the ability to have a good relationship with kids to truly have an impact with them, and that's one of the things that we're really proud of our staff. But when you bring people like Bob and Joe in to, to deal with issues and in their roles as police officers, you know, sometimes with little ones, just a uniform has, a, has an impact one way or another, but they make that very relaxing, and they make the kids feel very comfortable for, for you guys and for all of our other volunteers. Thank you so much for all you do for Franklin Public Schools. Thank you, and congratulations. Item five is approval of the agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Mrs. Klein, is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Witkowski. All those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item six is school board announcements. Do any board members have announcements tonight? I have an announcement. I attended the Ben Franklin a Spring Concert uh, last week. It was the Children of the World concert uh, put on by third and fourth grade. And that was actually the first time I was ever at a concert when one of my kids were on stage. So that was different, but it was, it was nice. And they did a really, really good job. And they had a, it was a, a Child of the World by, it was a play musical by John Jacobson and John Higgins. And the five themes were respect, honesty, courage, compassion, and responsibility. And they, uh, they did a really nice job. And it was a great message to send out there. So, yeah, Go ahead. No, are you done? I was just saying, it was my first experience with the new security measures, too, mm -hmm. where the parents were in the room, and the, the ones that s signed their children out so they could leave early uh, were, were brought down to the cafeteria, so all the parents had to go from the gym to the cafeteria and wait for their kids to get there. And if you didn't sign them out, you had to go around the front. So um, you know, we, those security measures that have been talked about, you know, they are in place, and I think the community and parents should feel good about it because the administration has done a great job of, of addressing that. Thank no. you. I just wanted to add on to Tim's comment about the musical that um, if any of you were unable to go to the Ben Franklin one, and I had plans that day, um, so I didn't go. There, um, the third and fourth grade students at Southwood Glen are performing the same musical on May 17th, which I believe is the week from Friday. So, thank you. Are there any other announcements? Thank you. Item seven is the school board calendar. We have a regular board meeting on Wednesday, May 22nd, 2013, here at the. Education and Community Center at 6 o'clock p.m. We have a regular board meeting on Monday, June 10th, 2013, here at the Education and Community Center at 6 o'clock p.m. And then uh, just we want to briefly discuss uh, the July meeting. Yeah, I, I had sent an email to the board today regarding the date for the July meeting, and on our uh, calendar that we had adopted, it, it already was on the 17th. We've had to change that for the reasons that were outlined in the email, so there's no need for anybody to, uh, to make any changes. I looked at the fourth Wednesday instead of the third, which we had already made the rest. Of it. So the July meeting is, in fact, on the 17th. So thank you. Thank you. Item eight is reports and presentations. Uh, we have the high school personalized learning update. And uh, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Nowak. Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, allowing us to take some time this evening to, uh, to share some information and, and an update with you uh, relative to personalized learning. Uh, in the last two years, I've had the opportunity to work closely with some really dynamic leaders uh, in the district around personalized learning and, and uh, this concept of personalizing instruction for students. And uh, a year ago, I came to the board and, and shared with you just some, some introductory information relative to where we were going as a district around personalized learning. 
uh, and I thought it'd be important to come back here a year later and share with you the progress we've made and then talk specifically from a high school perspective what we're doing at the high school to help advance personalized learning within the district. So uh, just some background information to, to kind of refresh your memory relative to uh, the things that have been happening over the last year. Uh, you know, we, we think about our kids uh, in a unique way and, and the fact that our, our children as learners are changing uh, in dynamic ways. Uh, and the way that they, they best learn uh, has evolved over time with the advent of increasing technology uh, and uh, the, the exposure that they need in terms of hands-on experience. Uh, and as we think about the changing workforce and the idea that, uh, you know, for many years in education it was enough to create uh, workers uh, and, and children as graduates who are able to go into the workforce and do some routine labor tasks uh, and that there was a nice job pool there relative to that. And that over time industry has changed and now there's a, a dynamic need uh, for really hands-on, well-trained learners uh, that can uh, collaborate effectively and can think dynamically and, and uh, work in a team and do a lot of things that, that we need them to do. Uh, and as you think about Bloom's taxonomy and, and uh, the, the evolution of education, uh, this idea that we should always be educating our learners in the top half of the spectrum. So it should be uh, focusing on analysis, evaluation, and creativity. <coughs> and that we want uh, dynamic students that are prepared to go out to the workforce and use those skills. A year ago, I also pointed out uh, really this continuum in terms of what does that mean if you break it down, what are those skills more specifically, and we talked about not only that analysis, evaluation, creativity side, uh, but the student ability to access their learning on a 24-7 basis uh, with a flexible schedule. Uh, you know, for a long time in education, we've fit students into this box of learning where we said, here's a 90-minute period where you're going to learn about geometry, and that is the time that you spend on geometry. Maybe you have a little homework, maybe you have a study period, maybe there's other times you, you dive into it. Uh, but, you know, years of psychology have taught us that sometimes learners learn best at different times of day. Sometimes students learn better at 7 at night or 8 at night, sometimes first thing in the morning, sometimes noon. And so when we lock them into this box of learning that's very uh, specific and tight, uh, that we're not always getting their best. And so looking at education options that expand learning to really 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that they can access the learning on their schedule when they want to. Uh, we also talked about explicit skill-based instruction, uh, so that we were teaching very specific skills relative to literacy, relative to uh, multiple curricular areas, uh, so that it wasn't just a comprehensive education, but a focused one for student skill development. Uh, we want an education for students that's reflective and allows them the opportunity to think about their learning and have time to process it and give feedback and get feedback. Uh, and so that reflective piece is important. Uh, and, you know, a number of other things that, that I won't go into details on that's up there. Uh, ultimately, we, we recognize that these are important things. And when you think about the traditional model of education, we're hamstrung a little bit in how do we best put this in the hands of our teachers so that our learners can advance and, and achieve these things. So we're challenged as an educational community to find dynamic ways to put these things in place. Uh, in terms of why make a shift to a more personalized environment for students where we're really tailoring an education to each individual child, uh, there's a number of things at the federal uh, and state and local level that are supporting that kind of shift. One of those things at the federal level uh, is the um, Education Department's Race to the Top grant. And uh, there are a number of grants that, that are given out by the Education Department uh, on a federal basis to states. Uh, and there are some very specific guidelines and requirements relative to who receives that grant money. Well, if you take a look at the last, uh, really most recently, the last year, uh, in terms of the grant money, they're, they're identifying their priorities. And they said in order to receive the grant money, uh, there is, a state has to qualify and meet the <coughs> obligation of absolute priority number one, and then at least one of several others. And if you take a look at what absolute priority number one is, uh, it's that the district that receives the grant uh, and the states that receive the grant are creating dynamic, personalized learning environments for students. And they specifically highlight college and career readiness, uh, districts that are and states that are aiming for a decrease in achievement gaps and that are creating environments that are really student-centered and allow <coughs> students to have a tailored, personalized education. 
the state level, uh, there's Agenda 2017, which is DPI's efforts uh, to uh, increase graduation rates and, and create more dynamic learning environments for students. I pulled some quotes uh, out of some of the, uh, the tenets of that, that movement in the state, uh, and I'll just read them to you. One said, use digital technology to change and enhance instruction, and the other said, expand high school programs for dual enrollment, earning college credit and specific career skills through industry certifications and youth apprenticeships. Uh, and these are some of the, the premier tenants of, of the goals of the state, uh, again, to, to increase graduation rates and create uh, more college and career ready students by 2017. There's also a number of federal studies that have been done uh, that support the shifts in learning environments. I referenced these a year ago. There was a, a meta-analysis done by the Department of Education in 2010 uh, that took a look at three different styles of learning, Fa traditional face-to-face -face instruction where you have a teacher and a class full of students, uh, a fully online course where students do not have any face-to-face -face interaction with, with teachers, and then finally a, a blended environment where there's a mixture of face-to-face -face and online instruction. Uh, and the study found that there was an increase in learning retention uh, and performance on a number of, of spectrums uh, in the environment that created a blended learning experience for students where they had some exposure to uh, the, the teachers and professionals uh, that are working in our schools mixed with some <coughs> online exposure and classes that allowed them to learn at their own pace uh, in a reflective environment in that 24-7 atmosphere. Um, so as you think about those things, there's a number of, of movements really at the federal, state, and local level to, to you know, push to a more personalized learning environment. Uh, and there are a number of factors that, that influence that. One of those is, a, a, again, a reliance on technology. Uh, this is from uh, U.S. News and World Report, Focus on Education, and they were talking about the fact that uh, in the 2011-2012 school year, 620,000 students nationwide took a fully online class, at least one, uh, and that's up 16% from the year previous. And if you continue to, to um, take that math and project it out, what you're going to find is that by 2020, the majority of students in the country will have taken at least one online course, if not multiple. Uh, over their high school and school career is even as low as middle school now. Uh, as a result, states are, are seeing that students are kind of fleeing the public school system at kind of an alarming rate and moving towards uh, fully online schools and virtual academies and a number of other charter schools and environments that are producing uh, an environment that's more conducive to student learning. And so states are recognizing that and they're wanting to retain public school students and as a result of that a number of states are passing laws that are requiring that school districts provide fully online courses to students so that they can have exposure to that. And this article references at least 10 states that have passed laws in the last two years relative to requiring online requirements for students. We also have an opportunity in this uh, fantastic city and district that is Franklin uh, to tap into some resources that I, I don't know that we, we fully have. And this really came to a head for me this year. Uh, there was a, a gentleman who um, was involved with an alternative school program called Second Chance. Uh, and they came in to, uh, to talk to us about what they do. And one of the things they do is uh, they work with local industry and manufacturing and school districts and have you as a district identify students that are maybe struggling to learn in a traditional environment. They take those students and they put them into a manufacturing position in your community and then they give them some traditional face-to-face -face classes to supplement and then provide them a high school education. And ultimately when you boil that down, it's a great opportunity for students, but in the end what's happening is districts are paying an outside alternative school to do what we should be doing as districts are ready and schools are ready. And that's leveraging the resources we have in the community and making sure that we're placing students in industry and using and taking advantage of all the expertise we have in the community to best educate our students. So when you think about all of those things, it, it you know, really speaks to, boy, we need to move forward uh, from a personalized learning perspective. And there, again, are some unique challenges relative to you know, our school day and our environment and the expertise we have in our buildings and how do we make those things happen. Uh, and I'm proud to say that in the last year, the district has taken some, some pretty significant steps forward relative to personalized learning. And these are a few of the examples of things we've done uh, to help personalize instruction for students at a at K-12 level. The one thing this does for us is it allows us to step back and look from a high school perspective uh, to, all right, so we've, we've taken these steps, but and, and while we're proud of these things and we can say, boy, we're really making some moves forward in terms of personalized learning, until you've really dynamically shifted the way the school day looks and you've offered some truly online experiences to students and you've truly involved the community and placed students into hands-on environments in terms of manufacturing, in terms of biomedical, in terms of the, all of the, the expertise we have, you haven't really personalized learning. 
you can take steps in that direction. And I think if you look to a lot of surrounding districts, there are a lot of districts that are doing some good things relative to personalized learning, but I think that many of them are limited to this type of approach at this point. I think you're still seeing some of the most dynamic learning environments be in some of these charter schools uh, in some of these breakout um, facilities because they have the flexibility to do what they want to do relative to um, personalizing experiences for students. So we need to continue to push ourselves and be really honest with ourselves about you know, what are the limitations and what do we need to do to overcome those so that we can personalize instruction for students. Um, from a high school perspective, we've taken time over the last year as we've implemented some of these things uh, to say, what does it mean to be personalized at the high school level? What specific things are we looking for? And there's a few paragraphs here, but I just highlighted in red some of the key words and phrases uh, that support a really personalized environment at the high school. We want to emphasize higher order thinking. Literacy instruction is front and center. We need flexible time for students. This element of student choice uh, is really an important one, and that is that students have some control over their education. You know, we have expertise in a number of educational areas, but at the same time, sometimes kids know best in terms of what they want out of their education, and we don't want to stifle their ability to take the classes they want to take and take the career path that they want uh, in terms of preparation. Uh, we need supportive technology and learning spaces. We have to continue to grow teacher capacity so they can support uh, the changing learner. Uh, and we need to make connections between curricular areas and career interests. And we really need to leverage that piece to make the learning more relevant for students. As a result, we thought about what we can do at the high school level to incorporate all of this. And so uh, we're moving forward and, and we would like to continue to move forward with a program we call Inroads. Uh, and it's an acronym that stands for Interdisciplinary Routes to Academic Success. But what it, what it is on its surface, uh, if you take a look at the high school um, college career readiness guide and the course guide, it's going to outline 17 different career clusters. And it's going to identify everything from engineering and manufacturing uh, to medical careers to accounting to a number of different areas. And we can, you know, advise students as to, boy, if you want to be an accountant, you know, you can kind of go down this path. But it, it's, it's not really laid out specifically for them. We, we generally say, well, you probably want to take some accounting classes and you want to take some business classes and we'll help counsel you as to what college will help prepare you and those kinds of things. But it's not real specific in terms of a, a clear path where we're connecting them with accountants in the community and we're setting up opportunities for internships. We're doing dynamic collaborative projects where they're working with other peers who want to be accountants and go out into the field and help uh, incorporate those things. So we, we, we need to figure out a way we can make that happen. And so we're, we're talking about a way at the high school we can narrow those 17 career clusters to five to seven areas, again, that we're calling inroads. And really what they are uh, are very focused and specific paths for students that provide them dynamic opportunities to get into the community, to work with peers that have similar career interests, uh, and, and to do the things that are relevant to their, their career and college goals so that they can be ready for what's, what's coming. Um, I have some examples of these inroads areas to the left, and they're by no means set uh, in stone. They're just examples of the kinds of things we're talking about, engineering and manufacturing, biomedical, global business, public service, fine arts. Uh, there are a number of areas you can kind of boil that down to. Uh, and uh, we've, we've chosen to really, in the next couple of years, focus in on two of these, and that would be engineering and manufacturing and biomedical sciences. If you take a look at the right side, it, it starts to reference some of the benefits that a program like this can have for students at the high school level. I'll give you a second just to look through those and then I'll talk about them. <coughs> I, I would like to point out, um, as Nick is, is speaking about high schools in general, you know, and, and personalization and personalized learning, uh, a way for me to conceptualize it is our, our main route to personalized learning at the high school level across the board at, at most of our high schools has been course selection. And that's what we've relied upon. And I, I guess our premise is that you can go much deeper than that. And what you see on the right is, is um, kind of a sampling of those next steps. Uh, it starts to encapsulate uh, a direction that we think is um, best for our students. Mm -hmm. 
you think about community connectedness, again, it's, we need to get our students into the community more, uh, particularly at the upper, upper levels of the high school. You think about junior, senior year, students are a year away from, from college or career of their choice uh, and really getting limited hands-on experience in the community. They're getting some great hands-on experience in, in the high school, in the building. They're working with dynamic instructors, uh, but they're not out in the career field. And if we have opportunities to do that, we really need to leverage that. Also, uh, we have the potential for untapped funding sources in the community uh, relative to um, some of these, these fields, particularly in manufacturing. I think there is a, a um, strong desire in the community uh, to have students come join what's happening so that they can make sure that they're assisting and training the next workforce. These are the students they're going to be hiring. They have a vested interest in their education and, and how, they're, how prepared they are to enter the workforce. I've personally have had two employers in the past week have approached me about Second Chance, the program that Nick was talking about. That tells me very clearly that employers and um, uh, industry within our community uh, is craving you know, the connections that we could have. And looking for a third party connection to bring us in, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, we need to have a higher degree of, of learner choice. This will allow us to do that. And what we're talking about there is really flexible scheduling uh, that produces environments for students that, that are best suited to them. You think about the student who um, maybe at 7.30 in the morning isn't, uh, isn't particularly engaged. If we can offer them an online option during that block that they could take uh, at some other point of the day and have them start their day at 9 a.m. It's an opportunity for them to, to um, learn when it's best for them uh, to learn. You think about summer opportunities. I think there's a strong desire in this community from the students uh, to uh, earn credit over the summer. That's not just uh, credit recovery, but credits that will help them advance in their high school career towards a diploma uh, and give them some real relevant hands-on experiences. We have some opportunities to, to provide that for students. Uh, so, so kind of trying to work outside the constraints of, of our, our typical schedule uh, to produce a way that <coughs> Uh, students can learn. Uh, increased relevance, I think, you know, an interdisciplinary education is important and, and students certainly need to be well-rounded, but at the same time, uh, we need to make sure that their learning is relevant. Uh, and we want students to have a vested interest in what they're learning on a daily basis. And when you engage them uh, in a hands-on way with the community, with potential employers, uh, it has a way of, of helping them uh, be more motivated relative to the types of things they're doing because they recognize the relevance and value of the work they're doing. Uh, you think about, you know, the, the planning we've done around the new facilities and the, the, um, the generosity of the community relative to the referendum, how important it's going to be with those, those facilities to not just have a change in the facilities themselves, but really change the learning that's happening in those facilities. Uh, it's one thing to, to put up new walls, it's another to transform learning that's happening in there in a dynamic way. And if we want to leverage the technology and the facilities that are coming, uh, then we need to, to, you know, transform the way we're approaching learning with kids. I, I would add, too, that really what we're trying to do is equip kids with the, with the ability to make decisions. Um, as students leave high school, the ability to make decisions about careers, the ability to make the right decisions. In the case of engineering, what we hear from secondary education is that too many kids um, enter the university level uh, thinking about going into engineering, and they've never gotten their hands dirty. They don't know really what it's all about. So in a nutshell, that's one aspect and one example of how this approach um, really tries to equip our students um, to be better off. Yeah, and we need to continue to target, um, use targeted career counseling relative to students. You know, as they're going through the process of high school, we're, we're doing a good job, I think, of advising them relative to, high, uh, to college and secondary ed and, and options that are available to them uh, post-secondary ed. Uh, but we're not necessarily advising them well from a community perspective. I think we have some expertise in the community that can really advise students relative to uh, planning in college. And if you really want this career path, here's what you need to do to get there uh, and what that looks like. And we should be tapping into that a little bit as well. And then creating that true interdisciplinary environment for students. Uh, I think it's important to kind of make this real a little bit in terms of, well, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another to see what a potential schedule could look like at the high school level. Uh, and again, this is, um, you know, this is, completely hypothetical, but it's an example of the types of things we could do uh, in, a, in a focused inroads pathway like this. If you take a look at that schedule, uh, this would be for a student who's in a global business and finance inroad, what that could look like for them. So you have the opportunity to take maybe an accounting one class, and maybe you offer that class either online or in a traditional blended environment at the high school, but the learner has some choice. Do you want to take it online or do you want to take it at the school? 
uh, and we provide them that opportunity. Blended environments in both Japanese three and economics, and then perhaps a fully online course called Business Ethics, uh, where they're able to engage uh, in learning in a new way with rich online discussions with other students, maybe not just in the Franklin community, but in other communities. Uh, your B-Day schedule business technology, maybe you have a course that's team taught by business ed and career tech ed, uh, and you come at it from really an interdisciplinary approach, two different perspectives. Uh, I referenced something there called seminar block. One of the thing that, things that's important is that we provide students an opportunity uh, to work on project-based learning that brings all of the learning together. And so perhaps students in these inroads are able to work with other peers who are also in the global business and finance inroad with a teacher who's helping direct some true project-based learning where they're doing some dynamic projects that have an impact on the community and the school culture. Uh, community internship one, so perhaps those students are in a, you know, involved in manufacturing or someplace hands-on two, three days a week and they're at the high school one day a week for this course where they're meeting with an instructor who's helping guide that process. Uh, and then they have a blended integrated math. What you see here is still an interdisciplinary education. They're hitting all of the different subject areas that they need to and, and to become a well-rounded student and citizen. Uh, at the same time, it's more targeted, more focused, and provides some relevance to student learning. It all is uh, applicable to their career goals relative to global business and finance. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see some of the supports that would be important to put in place. Not only is it important for them to have a counselor, but they also need to have a mentor teacher that they're working closely with and perhaps a community coordinator uh, who knows this inroad very well and can help advise students and guide them in a particular direction. Uh, and then just some examples of some supplementary projects and some other things they could be doing relative to an online portfolio, student organizations that support these things. For example, maybe students that are involved in the inroad are required to participate in forensics because it helps enhance their public speaking skills and it fits directly into this. Um, I, I'd like to add that real quickly. Um, that's a very, a very important part of this is the realization that learning occurs beyond the curriculum that you'll see on the left in activities, in those outside activities. Um, we know from our best students, or students who have gone through our school and had great success, they'll always allude to, um, you know, obviously their classes, but other experiences they've had and the impact they've had. So we try to maximize um, the impact through this process. One of the questions that I've gotten recently in talking about these things is relative to what about the student who uh, enrolls in a global business and finance inroad and then halfway through their sophomore or junior year says, what if I want to switch? I want to be in biomedical. I want to do something else. What have I done now to my, my high school career? And in the end, we're dealing with 14 and 15 year olds when they're entering high school. So how do we support that? My response to that would be any student that's gone through this process for however long they're involved in it, it's only going to benefit them educationally. Uh, you know, these dynamic hands-on learning environments that they decide in the end that they're going to go to a different career field, really that, that's irrelevant to me because it's about the skills they've learned as they're taking these courses and I don't, I think it would be hard to argue that this would be a detriment to their learning uh, even if they're not involved for a full four years. And I think, Nick, it's important to say that those are all developed around the existing curriculum. They're not Absolutely. additional or new curriculum. So it's they're getting the curriculum through the courses they choose, mm -hmm. and they could choose courses in any pathway and have pathway and have a common curricular area. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're talking about uh, and what we'd like to, to implement is an inroads pilot uh, to begin the 2014-2015 uh, school year in the fall. And we'd like to target some groups of ninth grade students in two areas, engineering and manufacturing and biomedical science. Uh, and there's some reasons that, that we picked those particular areas and we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but there are areas that we felt um, that we have a good base to create something like this and to, to move it forward. Uh, and uh, we, we think we're ready in these areas to, to really develop um, some dy dynamic learning experiences for students. Uh, there would be an application process into the, the pilot uh, and the support for these students would begin next year in eighth grade uh, as we begin to identify uh, students that have an interest in maybe one of these two career fields and would like to, to participate in this moving forward. Uh, and really what we're talking about here is a full four-year interdisciplinary experience. So it would begin really in eighth grade with some, some counseling and some support and then when they come to the high school ninth grade they would be engaging in a full four-year experience uh, in engineering and manufacturing or biomedical science. Again, realizing that if a student changes their mind halfway through, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna provide them the opportunity to transition out of that uh, with support if that's what they desire to do. Um, so 
this is, this is really the way that we've talked about looking again at, at the direction from a federal and state level in terms of personalized learning. Uh, and it, it's something that we feel like we need to do to really truly personalize instruction in Franklin. I, I think it's important to note that um, you know, this experience may not be for everyone. Um, you know, students and parents may look at it and say, you know, I'm, I'm feeling better about the traditional approach, the comprehensive experience. Um, you know, as we see it, that experience is in place and stable with us right now. But um, the other part of that is we really believe, and Nick and I have had many discussions about this, that this experience stands to influence what our comprehensive experience looks like as well. If there are things that these students are doing, um, you know, and, and they're having success with, um, we would hope that that would impact, um, you know, a traditional science class, a traditional math or English class, or, or any other class. It's also important to note that, um, in, you know, in our vision for this, uh, two things. One, it really needs to be teacher-owned uh, and directed. You know, we, we kind of <coughs> met as a team around uh, what are some things we can do to support. But in the end, it's going to be the teachers in this community that we know are fantastic. They're going to be developing the curriculum and working through the creation of these things and really making it a, a comprehensive learning experience for students. And so it's going to be really important that, that they own these things as we're moving forward. Uh, the second thing that, that uh, is important for us as we, we think about all of this uh, is that we need to set up opportunities for students to take these courses if there are new courses in fact that are created as a result of this uh, even if they're not in an inroads experience so if we have a dynamic biomedical course that we're teaching as part of that that inroad that students can still take that biomedical course even if they're not in that program um, the, the program is really just a more focused track for students again with some of those community components that may not be there uh, in other places how many students are you looking to Get in the first group. Yeah, we've had discussions around that. I think, you know, ideally if we could, we could aim somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 per. So if we did a 30 student pilot in biomedical and a 30 in manufacturing engineering, that I think would be a good start for us. Uh, at the same time, I'm a little bit hesitant to, to close off students if there is significant interest in it. Uh, I would hate to turn away, turn away 15, 20 kids that really want to be in a biomedical track, you know. So I think we have some target numbers in mind, but I would hesitate to put too hard of a cap on that. Well, I feel like I've just taken a drink out of a fire hose, the uh, information <laughs> that, uh, that you've thrown up there. Um, how big um, do you look at as community? Because when you think about careers and employers, the world's bigger than Franklin. And, you know, we're in a suburban, you know, regional area. What is your thought on that? Well, it's an interesting uh, point to reference the region because the region is, is dominated by medical facilities. Um, the regional is region is dominated by manufacturers. You could look at all those areas and point to things that we as a metropolitan area have to some degree at our disposal. So it's really about making those connections. And, and I can say with absolute confidence, those places, those organizations, those community partners are craving you know, these kinds of connections um, for all kinds of reasons. It's great for them, it's the right thing to do. It ultimately builds their workforce um, down the road. So that's an integral part of this. But it could be bigger than Franklin. Then. Absolutely. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you think about, for example, from a medical perspective, obviously we've got Wheaton Franciscan in our backyard, but we've also got Children's, we've got Pro Health, we've got Aurora. Um, there's so many things happening, you know, at the medical complex. Um, so there's, there's absolutely. Yeah, to your point, we'd be foolish to limit ourselves to, to just Franklin in terms of that. There's so many resources in the state of Wisconsin, particularly in southeast Wisconsin. I've noticed also in your typical class schedule, I mean, English is usually required for four years. Is that why you would need to embed that, that literacy component in your classes, or will they, will they take English, or is English just embedded in the experience? You still have to follow the state expectations around the statute, so every um, inroad would ensure that if a student was that targeted they would meet all of the state expectations it's just um, instead of teaching a generic course it's focus to the work of that yeah. in, in Rome. A, a great example I toured GA um, last week and they took me to stations where they pulled out um, manuals that had technical writing um, technical writing to a T and they talked about what it took to produce the manuals. It, took to, it, it talked about who created them. Um, 
how, how significant they were to the overall operation of the plant, but it's a good example of how literacy plays into the workplace. One of the things we're trying to do is get away from having a siloed educational system where we just have math courses for those people in math and so on, and to integrate them in all of these areas. And to Mike's point just now, it wouldn't be necessarily a traditional English class that you would take. It would be infused into some of the inroads programs that are really more focused and designed for the writing skill that you referenced to be able to do that in a outside environment under a professional people it would, usually do it. The Common Core standards would still be present. They mm -hmm. would just have the flavor of that area. And the one of the biggest research thing components out there about the lear, student learner of today is they want their learning to be relevant and it needs to be transferable. And if you tend to teach in isolation or silos, they don't tend to experience the success they should. Mm -hmm. So, and the change in literacy, I know at the state level we've gone away from literature based to more right. of you. So, are they going to read Romeo and Juliet then somewhere in there? I would hope. I was, no. a, I was an English teacher. <laughs> um, actually, you know. we, we came across something over the weekend that um, I forget what the match was. It was English and science. Mm -hmm. And I think that the idea there is they're still reading novels, but maybe they're novels that have you know a, a science bend to them or something like that, or you know those kinds of things. Yeah. At, the end so. of the, at the end of the day, it's about the skills and the skill standards and how are they accessing those skills. And there's a variety of ways you can teach to those skills. Still a and place and for the students works. will choose a novel that they find of interest so they learn the skills versus a novel they're required to teach and are so busy worrying about the fact that they have to read a novel that they don't acquire the skills. And that, that came out loud and clear in the literacy view, the review. The two things the parents and the students asked were for were voice and choice in their work. So this is a great way to demonstrate that. Then the other area that I know it's, it's kind of missing in there is, you know, the whole social studies aspect and in our history, our shared history, you know, part of public education is, is you know, we're all part of the, you know, same country. And where does that get go into there? Are you talking about with this example? Correct. Well, think, or I'm just assuming. Yeah, this is, I mean, I'm speaking for Nick. But this is just a snapshot. Yeah. Um, obviously, social studies and um, the role of community and government and all, uh, is, is imperative so it's not like it's, it's not like it's being pulled out or you know it's it's its value is lessened it's just that the connection to it I mean global business you've got social studies all over the place. Well in this example economics would be yeah. kind of your capstone social studies course there but but yeah there's a place for all of the, I mean we still need to teach the state standards and the, the requirements that are there so they'll still be there. And then my, I hope it's my last question is um, you know we you have to earn credits to, to graduate. How do we adjust that system of, you know, how do we know you're graduating, you know? Yeah, um, you know, as we look at this example, I can still see kind of a, a credit-bound um, environment, but um, in, you know, as, as personalized learning at a continuum, when you look way out at the far end of it, it becomes a matter of, it, as kids are engaged in, say, like a, a project-based experience, maybe it's a, semester long project that literally takes maybe half their day. It becomes a process, and it's not an easy process, but a process of in essence sort of teasing out um, the credit, if you will. And that's all stuff that would be, have to be thought through prior and discussed thoroughly. But um, it's all the, the notion that um, their credit or, or you know, whatever you, however you want to deem that is inherent in the work that they're doing. It's, it's on our shoulders and everyone's shoulders to, to uh, discern that. Here again, we're talking about a pretty archaic system when we, when we talk about credits and hours and all those things. This really sort of throws all that out, so to speak. At the same time, we know we have the accountability piece. It's just going to be, you're not going to get uh, a credit if you sit in a math class for a, a semester. Yeah. It's going to be more integrated into the student's choice, and it might, it might be called business uh, economics. That might be part of that math class. So. It'll be non-traditional ways of thinking, but it's, to, it's still gonna be able, we still are gonna have the obligation and the ability to meet those archaic methods right now, but I think in a couple of years, if, if that's even soon enough, we'll see some dramatic changes in the way we take a look at uh, what we expect out of kids. You know, at the end of the day, we can, we can do this and we can take steps in terms of personalized learning and we can be satisfied with that, 
Um, but really, you know, if, if we're going to take those steps to truly personalize instruction for students, it's going to take some dynamic shifts in the way that we do things relative to, to time and access. Uh, and, you know, so we feel like we're, we're in a position where we're ready to do that and, and make some changes in a dynamic way to really set Franklin apart uh, in terms of the, the education we're providing students overall. But the pilot's still a year away, though, right? It won't be yeah, we would, we would need, obviously, time to, to prepare and get the yeah. curriculum set and do the things we need to do to, to have that in place. One of the things that I see jumping on at me here is um, in conjunction with the Common Core State Standards is the relevance and rigor. And, you know, you obviously you increase the rigor, but to tie that into relevance, you can't get any more relevant if you're dealing with members of the community, tying in business. Um, so I see that as an interesting blend right there. I mean, a blend in a team taught by a business ed and CT instructor, and I mean, that's, I think that's outside of the box right there. That's a good point, Tim, and to Nick's mm -hmm. earlier point, when kids are actively engaged in doing learning that they want to do, their level of rigor is sort of self-imposed and it rises on its own. Uh, it, it goes from self-imposed rigor to self-relied uh, relied upon motivation where teachers are trying to get kids to like literature. Well, if it's embedded in a different learning style to something they're interested in, it takes on a whole different dimension, and now the rigor that's applied to that, those kids don't mind it because they like doing it. Or they don't even know they're learning it. It's yeah, just exactly. just coming. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, just to your point about the, the preparation in, in terms of that, just to show you, we you know we have some pretty specific goals kind of laid out for the next year relative to the things we'd like to accomplish to, to make this happen. And again, I just highlighted in red some of the, some of the key areas. Um, part of this is going to be that we needed to identify a coordinator or teacher to help support this work. When you think about uh, you know really the scope of this and. Um, you know, there's a fair amount of planning and, and preparation, making those community connections and all of that piece. Uh, and so it's important for us to identify somebody that can take a leadership role there and help train our teachers and, and help move us forward relative to that and, and um, kind of help organize those things. Uh, we also talked about a curriculum redesign in biomedical and, and engineering that will become important. Uh, and, we, you know, we offer a number of exceptional engineering courses already, but there is some expansion of that curriculum that will need to occur to some extent. Uh, and then we need to set ways that we can track to ensure that we're being successful uh, and that, that students are engaged throughout the entire process and that they're advancing. I would hope that the pilot doesn't, um, that it has a, a range of student learning abilities mm -hmm. and it's not just target. I'd like to see how, how well it meets the, uh, the average or even the more challenged student. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that that's something that should be the goal without question. Um, you know, part of this is helping kids um, who maybe didn't realize they had certain abilities or maybe weren't, weren't having um, as much success in a traditional approach to, to blossom. So mm -hmm. to that point, definitely. And par as part of this, we're increasing support for students. We've talked about three counselors, you know, as an example, community counselor, a couple of counselors in the district that help support around that. Uh, we've talked about a literacy lab and a math lab at the high school that are going to be focused in terms of interventions and working with students. Uh, so if there's a student in in-road that's struggling in terms of literacy, they're, they're really having a hard time with a technical manual and they need some reading strategies, that they can go to a literacy instructor and they can work with their peers and that instructor to get some targeted instruction. So uh, I think it's important that we ramp up the support around students that are in these, these programs rather than decrease uh, because it is a different way of learning uh, and uh, they'll need some support around that, that process. So and I think to your point, second choice was the um, company that helps spark They've been mulling around how to redesign education at the high school, and when they saw that flyer, it sparked an idea, but this program isn't designed to be a second choice. It's designed to be a first choice for students who learn best this way. So that, that the philosophy of that company has nothing to do with this idea. Is Inroads our own Franklin program, or is it something that you, that's out there and you kind of, you know, you can copy it or? Yeah. Or model it or, uh, it's, yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> personalized learning is, um, you know, that, that phrase in itself has been around really just the last few years. I mean, we've talked about personalized learning for students for a long time, but this concept of personalized instruction hasn't been around all that long. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you think about, you, you always look to the model school that's kind of doing these things. I think, you know, in the end, if you're continuing to look to model schools, you're, you're following pretty much your whole 
your full existence. You know, I think there comes a point where you need to lead a little bit relative to that as well. Um, that's not to say there aren't schools that are doing these things effectively. I think there are, and if you look around the country, there are some, some pretty dynamic, uh, like engineering or biomedical-based high schools that are doing some great things in the community and, and setting up these partnerships, and, and they're, they're highly rigorous, and these students are getting into exceptional colleges. Uh, so they exist, and the examples are out there. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes to always look around and point to the school that you want to emulate. You know, I, I think in Franklin, we want to be the school that others emulate. Uh, and so, so this is our own. Yeah, it what is. we would hope to do is look at all um, the different approaches that are, we're seeing across the country, and there are plenty. Um, you know, kind of look at strengths, look at weaknesses, limitations. Um, can that be considered of what's realistic for us? Um, what's practical for us and ultimately arrive at something that um, we think supports the direction of personalized learning. I know you talked about the need for it to be teacher owned, but yeah. parents have to grasp what you're trying to do here too, yeah. don't they? Yeah, and that, that obviously would, we've talked about it, but that would involve um, community sessions. It would involve community sessions with partners, bringing partners to a room like this or to you know an event to talk about um, this type of education and, and, and movement. It would involve bringing parents together in the same manner, mm -hmm. um, really in an informative manner. Um, you know, I, I, you think we have kids, we think about would we want this for our, our kids? Um, would they benefit from it? I think parents will want to have those kinds of choices. They'll want to know no. Those schools throughout the country that have adopted these kinds of programs and built upon them have found that they were even driven more heartily by the parents that got involved and said, we want more of this for mm -hmm. our kids. And what I think you find when you get into these kinds of uh, programs uh, over time, two or three years, I think we're going to find out that uh, there are a lot of kids that we would not have anticipated would fit into this mold, if you will, but have demonstrated, number one, just in a a desire to get involved in it because you'd mentioned it several times Nick and Mike you know kids don't know what they don't know and we in education have traditionally forced kids into take your reading take your math but we have to be able to put them in a position where they're applying it to things that they want to do when they walk out our doors and like I've you know we've talked a number of times there's millions of jobs out there but these are the ways those kids are going to be able to access those jobs because they're going to have the skills it's not going to be just traditional experiences and learning we have to go above and beyond that Unless you have some questions earlier. I did have a question. I, first, a comment. I think the, the transferable skills is really going to be the key because I can't think of very many eighth graders who know what they want to do with the rest mm -hmm. of their lives. Um, so, um, you know, I, it sounds like you guys have that covered, so that's good. Um, my question was, this is maybe kind of a detailed question, but it was bouncing around in my head, is we've had such a push the last several years for AP credits. Yeah. And I was kind of wondering if maybe you guys could comment on how this works along with that and the weightings. And I know as long as we have class rankings, that those kind of considerations are going to be important to kids. And how are we going to make it fair so that kids that are in inroads and kids that are not in inroads have the same kind of opportunities? Yeah. Um, a, a quick comment, uh, and it goes back to Linda's comment about you know not attracting only the high-end kid. Mm -hmm. A lot of times in these environments, high-end students um, sometimes might shy away from this experience well, because of thinking. lack of AP. So it's our job to build an experience that gives them the practicality that we're talking about, um, but at the same time allows them those AP experiences and those things that aren't going away. That, I mean, AP is an institution. It is, and, and we know that, we know what it means relative to college application and those kinds of things. So that has to be on the table. The neat thing is, you know, if you get a kid interested in, in this kind of direction, um, you know, goes to go, is part of this experience as a you know, freshman, sophomore year, our hope is that maybe there's a kid there that says, you know what, and I don't know how it would work, but at the same time, I've realized now that I can take AP Physics because of what I'm doing. So that's part of how this all kind of supports itself. I think a big part of it too is over time, we, we do a lot of the data and it's not only those kids who will apply to get in there, we're gonna be tapping some kids on the shoulder and saying, this might be something that interests you and give them a little prompting to say, 
you know, give it a try and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Because to Mike's point, there are some kids that might not readily say, I want to do that for fear of failure. And what we have to do is ensure that this is a, a fear of how successful you'll be instead of failure, mm -hmm. if that's the case. Well, I was going to ask about personalized learning in general and family. You know, I think their family is so used to, and parents, to rigid, you know, everything is rigid. Where do they come in at all? I mean, at least for, you know, my kids are graduated a while ago, but it, it used to be, did you get your homework done? <laughs> I mean, do you even ask that anymore? And, and will you with personal, personalized learning? Um, how, how does, how's it going to work? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think we see some of that already relative to, you know, I think about what we did in high school with math and, and I am nine, assuming graded math model, where we have Carnegie, which is an online experience that students are engaging in along with the face-to-face -face instruction in the classroom. And one of the things we heard from parents right off the bat was, I don't know how to help my son or daughter anymore in math. I don't know what to do. And, and there's a level of frustration, I think, with that relative to, I, I don't, I don't know. I think what we've found and what we've talked about is it's going to be important that we continue to educate and support parents as well as their sons and daughters when they're at the high school level. And one of the things we did with this with the math program is we had multiple parent nights. We had the technology set up. We brought parents in. We put <coughs> teachers alongside them and showed them the technology along with their, their student so they could all look at it together. And then I think people felt more comfortable with that walking out at the end of that and saying, well, I think I know now how I can support uh, at home. Now, I think it'll be important that we really support families along with this uh, and, and kind of teach them some of those things and I those think, skills too. I think when I attended the uh, high school session on, on the change in the grading, mm -hmm. I think in the end of the evening, I think one of you made the comment that really parents have to think about unlearning some of the things that they mm. thought when they grew up and, and now it's different. I don't know if that's scary or, but uh, we know more about learning than we did maybe when we were going to school and yeah. we have to kind of. That's a really good point. We're also getting into that culture now of kids uh, who are parents now who have grown up more in the digital age and have grown up with the kinds of things we're trying to do at a much higher level. Uh, you know, parents that are my age are still sitting there thinking a whole lot differently way, the way we were educated. And now we're getting those parents who are pretty much demanding these kinds of things take place and if they're not there, uh, we have to show the relevance for their children to be able to do that. But I think their parents in this age, day and age now are coming to us very skilled in terms of what their kids, you know, just take technology, for example. I mean, half the parents now, uh, I don't know about half, just vi the video game thing that I mentioned the other night, that is something that these kids are brought up on, and that's that challenging aspect. That's that reaching for a better goal. More importantly, it's doing what I'm interested in, I like doing that, so if you give me the tools to do what I want to do, I'll do better at it. And it's, it's a, I think it's going to be real exciting for us. I, I would just say, too, you know, that we referenced literacy a few times, and, and to, to Janet's point, literacy has to be there, and it, and it always will be, because from, from this perspective, literacy is about um, developing critical thinkers and developing independent critical thinkers. So that's woven into this. And I think that, you know, plays into that parent piece. You know, it's not like we're completely removing the way we've done things relative to reading text or um, taking notes or writing and those kinds of things. It's, it's still there, but we're trying to build those skills in kids. But, I, but what I mean is it, it won't be standard homework. It's, it's going to be more mm -hmm. projects and, and independent. Nothing a parent can monitor, really. You don't right. be, yeah, you don't be, be talking about it at home. You don't mm -hmm. bring excitement. You don't that would lead to um, some easier discussions about careers and those kinds of things down the road. But you know, if you, if you walk through an elementary building today, you would see things that kids have created at home that is, is pretty amazing. Now, their parents on some of them helped quite a bit, but those kids still had the ability to go home, create a project, bring it back, and it was based on a theme and so on and so forth. So even at the younger levels, we're seeing that, that creativity component of this whole thing and maybe a little critical thinking that I think we're, it's going to continually develop on the lower grades. And maybe it'll open up conversation between parents and kids about what parents do for a living, you know, mm -hmm. what, work, what their work day is like what kind of skills have you used today? So I'll change the conversation. I just want to add one thing, though. Is, you know, we talk about importance of literacy, but, you know, YouTube's out there. Um, I mean, I work with 
younger people, if they want to know how to do something, they're not necessarily going to go and look for the, the how-to book. They'll just pull up a video and they'll watch how to do it. So do we yeah. really need to? Well, there's, there's a skill to that, too, in that. Mm -hmm. right. but I'm just saying that there's options besides mm -hmm. reading how to do something. We can now see how to do something. Right. And there's a lot of emphasis in tying in uh, business and community and everything, but this isn't an alternative track for people who don't want to go to college then just want to go right into career. This is for, for both angles, right. essentially, right? Yep. So even though you're you know, talking about the AP, mm -hmm. how are we going to you know, weave that in there? But this still is something that is for the student who's looking to really do both. It's about developing skills, ultimately, yeah. that'll help them. And way. really, when I think about the AP, it's not really so much it's a class, it's passing the test. So maybe they'll be so motivated to learn the material, they'll just take the test, prepared as they might, but learning that? might be a different way. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things out of Agenda 2017 are state expectations expectations um, around the waiver is we need to string together courses so kids see that cluster effect and can make better decisions about their career and college choices outside of school because right now they do everything so independently we hope this rules out as much as it rules in because they don't have that opportunity and you see many kids going to college and they get one or two years in and they often drop out because it didn't fit or they um, aren't aware of all the opportunities they have. So that's why the state's expecting us to design that way to prevent that dropout or that 10 year college track because they're changing their minds so often. And isn't today bring your child to work day or was that yesterday? That was last week. Last week? Okay. Interesting that that's uh, something that hasn't really caught on yet. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank we you. really appreciate Thank your you. time. Yeah. Thank you. So. Okay, uh, the next report is Human Resources Report, Non-Certified Staff Compensation Update, and Personnel Report Approval. Dr. Miller. Um, okay, um, actually we'd like to discuss with you, um, or have the board reach consensus this evening on providing our um, uh, non-certified, non-represented employees the same um, increase for this school year that you approved for our represented employees. As you recall, the board approved a 2.7% increase for our teachers, uh, the SOEA group, the custodians, and the food service employees. Um, so we are, are working towards those agreements with the uh, teachers and with the SOEA. Um, we've already reached an agreement with our custodial group and I have been recently informed that um, our food service uh, group is no longer um, a union or a represented group. I have not, however, received official documentation of that, but um, once I do, they would fall into this category of non-represented. So um, we'd like to move forward with providing that 2.7% increase to our uh, non-certified, non-represented employees as well. Can you list again, please, exactly who those em employees are? Um, our non-represented employees are those that don't belong to Well, uh, I, I mean the exact, um, are you talking about administrators? Administrators would be in that group. It would be the individuals who support the administrators, administrative assistants. Um, we have speech, uh, excuse me, we have psychologists, social workers who are non-represented. Um, OTPT? Bus drivers. Bus drivers, occupational therapists, physical therapists. This is across the board then? Yes. <clears throat> when you put that in the budget, you had, um, yeah, I think you had a different number in the budget, but when you had that considered across the board, as mm -hmm. you put it in the budget? Right, it was in the budget across the board at a higher percentage than that. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we accept um, the proposal and um, vote on it. I'll second that. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll second that. Um, what is the exact motion, please? 
if you need Mrs. Dr. Miller's help, <laughs> is um, that the board approve a 2.7% um, pay increase for our non-represented employees. Okay, we have a motion by, um, motion by Mrs. Klein and a second by Mrs. Larson. I, I, is there any discussion? Yes, um, our agenda doesn't have that as an action, an action item. And also, it indicates it's for non-certified staff. It doesn't say non-represented, which I believe is broader than non-certified. Mm -hmm. Is that an issue? Is that a problem since? No, it's not. And, and just because it's not uh, noted as an approval item, as long as it's on the agenda, it can be acted on by the board. And there is the word there. Uh, that the human resources report in the, the approval part of it is what we're seeking for that. So it doesn't have to be declared, be declared as an action item. It's already on the agenda to do so. Um, also, I know in the past um, administration, we have, we have pooled the increase and allowed um, uh, Steve to make some uh, right. recommendations within that. And, and we would still like to do that like we had in the past. We've, we've done that every year, I don't know how many, prior to my getting here I know, and it works out well because we have a couple of administrators we'd like to give some increases to that are lower on the end, some associates and so on. I want to clarify, Dr. Patz, are you, you are not included in this? Yes, I am. I'm an administrator. Always have been. Is is the motion accurate then in, in just stating two point seven across the board? Do we need to really create that? Um, um, I could amend it to say an average of two point seven. That would be appropriate. Two point seven is the pool you're working with, but you'd right. have discretion within the pool. Right. That's right. So it really wouldn't necessarily be an average. I would just like to say, and I don't know how you know this vote will turn out, and that's fine, but when I read the agenda and I was looking at the agenda, non-certified staff compensation update and personnel report approval, we got the personnel report, which there were a few people on there for approval. Personally, I feel like I'm getting a little bit of a curveball tonight. That's all. And I'm not trying to be unfair. I'm just, and I don't know that it's, you know, going to be an issue, and I don't have a problem with, um, like the equity and we talked about we already had discussion but I just want to say I think that with the way this was listed I thought I got a little bit of curve all time we've listed this that this way every year it's it's never been any different well a reports a report and an action items an action item I, I'd like to amend the motion amend the motion to um, separate the administrators um, and Dr. Pats, as we did the same thing last year, I'd like to amend the motion to separate administrators and Dr. Pats from the original motion. Speaking on behalf of the administrators, could I ask why? Um, We've never I'll done. Talk, I'll talk, yes, we have done that. I'll talk about that. No, when we no, have, we have we not have, done that no. before. We've never separated the administrators out. <coughs> yes, we have. Um, no, we I, have not since I've been here. Not since you've been on the board. I, I, I'm not going to argue with it. With you. I, I have a. I'd like to amend the motion to separate the administrators and Dr. Pats from the original motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have an amendment to the motion. Is there any discussion? I'm curious as to why you'd like to do that. <clears throat> um, well, I would like to do that because I do not think the administration and Dr. Pats are on the same level as the regular uh, non-certified staff and should be considered separately. Maybe you want to give them more of a raise than the other group. 
because of the work they do. Is that what you <clears throat> is that what you're saying, Mrs. Evans? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying they're not on the they're I do not consider them on the same level. Um, and to be frank, um, I don't consider them on the same level because they were not paying from January to July um, WRS payments this past year. And I do not consider them on the same level. Do they not work as hard? Uh, that is as, not, that's not my. Well, I, I'm just trying to understand the level. I don't know how you're differentiating. This between has nothing them. to do with, I'm not I, talking I'm about the, your words. I'm not talking about. I'm using about your words. They're not on the same level. I'm just asking how it is that you're. administrators and directors. That's, differ, that's I'd like to level. get out my question, please. I'm just asking how you're differentiating between them. I, I, I guess I'm trying to understand why they aren't on the same level. Because we have psychologists and social workers, and we have administrators, and we have a superintendent, mm -hmm. and that is not the same level. Um, it's just not. There's different levels of responsibility. I understand that. I understand that part. Different levels of responsibility are already accounted for in the um, current salary. Agreed. I agree with that too. Mm -hmm. I understand that. So a, a percentage increase, um, unless one group doesn't deserve it um, and, and one does, then I don't see a reason to break them out. I guess I would also like to point out, though, given the fact that they are higher compensated, the percent does not really suggest equality. It suggests just a number that's applied to. There's more dollars. A higher compensation, you know, you know what I mean. It, the, it will result in higher compensation because you have a bigger base. So, percent is only one element of the of calculating the increase that they receive. But it's an important point. So would, say, an administrator not be entitled to more compensation because of those responsibilities you're referring to and their level of education versus maybe, and this is not to be disparaging to any group, but someone's level of education or experience versus an administrator versus, say, some, a member of the custodial staff. It's, it's different, and we compensate our people for that. We reward, if you will, our people for that. So why would we not offer administrators the same 2.7% that we're offering to everyone, even though that 27 will be a greater amount for an administrator that is, um, goes hand in hand with the amount of responsibilities and duties that person has? That's not the motion. The motion is to separate. No, but them. we're discuss we're just discussing. So I, I understand the motions, but we're just discussing each other's ideas, that's all. And we already are giving Dr. Pats the ability to reward administrators based on his evaluation of their performance. So mm -hmm. nobody's necessarily getting the same amount. So I again I don't know why the same percent would necessarily equate to how we evaluate them as groups. That evaluation will take place when, when Steve evaluates their performance. We're only just creating the pool of money that mm -hmm. he can use for that purpose. So should they not have the same pool of money to work from? I, why does it have to be the same? They're not, it's, it's a different level of responsibility than the the person that's working with kids and doing the day-to-day, -day, you know, we're expecting a lot different things. And I, I want to be clear that this across the board for me mm -hmm. is not about value your, of your performance. It's about cost of living. Have things increased where you would require additional money to, to, to maintain your standard of living. To me, it's not about mm -hmm. evaluating your work. It's about maintaining your salary relative to the economy and everybody else that works here. So 
please don't think that I, you know, don't value their work. To me, it's not about that. That evaluation takes place when Steve mm -hmm. gives you your performance review. But isn't co cost of living is measured based on a percentage, which this number is, t is already somewhat tied to? I think that someone at a higher pay scale has the ability to adjust to economic conditions better than someone who is only making. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to argue with that, Mrs. Woodcall, because I don't think that's being fair to administrators. That's like saying you guys and women get paid more, so therefore you should get paid less to adjust to the economy. Our people work pretty doggone hard. And whether you're an administrator or a teacher or a custodian, whatever, for our administrators, we chose to do the jobs we do. You chose to do the job you do. You have executives in your county level that make more than you do. And that's true in any organization. And I think when you take a look at levels of responsibility, of course they're dramatically different. But my level of responsibility and Jim's and Judy's and, and anybody in this room that works for the school district are all different. So would the custodians be compared to the certified staff or to the teachers? So the differentiation there too. I, I got to tell you, I'm disappointed that the board has taken the approach, or that, not the board, that the approach is being taken to single the administrators out by saying that we have the ability to adapt to the economic conditions better than somebody else does because we make more money? The discussion is only to separate. I said, really, it leaves the possibility of giving you more. You're making the assumption that it's going to be the same. Okay. This is only about separating them. And I would say this, we don't want more. We're talking about the question of separating the groups. That is the, uh, the issue. Right, but during the discussion, if, if that's your argument, then I want to tell you that the administrators don't want more. With regard to your discretion of the pool of money that we're talking about, that is at the administrator level? The other groups that you're, rep that you're referencing That's everybody. Is, I'm sorry? It's everybody. It's everybody. All so you would have the, so whatever this 2.7 should this pass, the dollars that are created, you would have that discretion amongst all of the right. non-representatives. and that's what we've done every year. Uh, the directors, we sit down just a week or maybe two weeks ago, we sat down and I asked the directors about people in their areas and how they were performing and so on, and that's what we would do. Okay to formulate that. I'm confused. Are you saying that even custodians will be evaluated? No. no. Is, was that your question? Or was it just about the administrators? Yeah, well, I, well, I was asking, because there's, there's other groups in the um, non-certified staff, you said are like custodians. Administrative assistants, a psychologist, a social worker, bus driver. OK. Um, but you wouldn't have, as part of that pool, get together with your, your administrators or staff and and decide who would get what amongst, or would you, amongst all the groups that she just rattled off? It would be amongst your directors. Yeah, we could. Okay. In, in most cases, and for the last six years, we've, we've done that, maybe it's affected three people annually. So like the bus drivers, as an example, may not get, all get the same if there was a standout. Not it, There's a possibility, yeah. Okay, that's just, I want to know who was on the table with regard to the, the pool of discussion. Is there any other discussion on the amendment to the motion? <clears throat> Hearing none, um, then we'll have a, a roll call on the amendment to the motion. Okay. Mrs. Evans? Aye. Mrs. Klein? No. Mrs. Larson? No. Mr. Nielsen? No. Mr. Alexandrovich? <clears throat> I'm going to abstain. I say no. Mrs. Witkowski? Yes. One abstention, two yeses, and four noes. Okay, the motion fails. Okay, then. We are back to the original motion to approve the 2.70 <coughs> compensation for all non-certified staff. Can we have a roll call, please? Can, sorry, oh. point of information, though. I believe the motion is not to give a 2.7 to all staff. It's to provide a pool equivalent to 2.7 for all staff that the superintendent Pats will have the discretion of. That was the original motion? 
I don't know if that was the original motion, but well, I don't know if you amended your motion. That's what the original motion. That was my intention. I didn't specify it. Then maybe we should have we should have a motion stated well, as to what we're going to vote on. Or if that was well, that the was the original motion, is there is someone making an amendment to the motion? Because we'll have to vote. I will make that amendment as stated that this will create a pool, not not everybody 2.7, but a pool for discretion. There's an amendment to the motion by Mr. Nielsen. Is there a second? Second by Mrs. Klein. Is there any discussion? So are you saying then that the pool is for basically all non-represented staff? Right. That's what he's and, saying. And Steve can give 0% to the bus drivers, 2% to the educational assistants, and X to this person, and... An unethical, unprofessional superintendent would do that? I don't consider myself one of those. I think that's proven out in plenty of time. I'm just clarifying that that's what that motion allows. Well, you're well, clear I, yeah, I just want to make sure there's not an inference there that I'm going to pick certain people to give them nothing and that somebody else will get an 8% raise. Uh, that has come up to, within this board in the past, and it's, it's not appropriate discussion. We're talking about one or two or three people that may get a little bit more and some others that might uh, be about the same or a little bit less. Would that Most be, decisions are made after they're evaluated by their supervisor or yourself. And then they are not solely my dis, uh, decision. We have discussions with the directors and so on. Another question then for Judy. So are there any, this says non-certified on the agenda. Are any of those represented? The non-certified? Uh, no. I guess I'm not clear on who down, what, what's non-certified again? Is it the educational assistant? No, it would be like an administrative assistant, a bus driver's not certified. Those would be some examples of people who don't hold a license or are certified by the state to do their job. I believe my original motion was, was stated non-represented. Yeah, I guess, yes. I'm, I'm struggling a little yeah. bit, you know, the new guy, so forgive me, but it's okay. that, as I understand it, Dr. Patz is the only person that the board hires. Mm -hmm. So why is the board not making the determination on the increase on Dr. Patz? I mean, because I can understand the administrative people being included in this, but I'm struggling with if this, there's going to be a pool of money that's going to be distributed, and, and I'm not questioning your ethics at all on this, but shouldn't the board make the determination if it's 2.7 for Dr. Pats or, or 5 percent? Be, because... Well, that's what you're doing right here with the 2.7. As I said, we don't want more. Well, I, I understand that, but the motion as it sits is, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it is a pool of money that we're doing at 2.7 percent to be distributed um, at the discretion of, I don't know, uh, Dr. Pats and the administration, I, I assume. I don't know whose discretion it is. But I'm, I'm just wondering if you're our only employee, do we make that decision or do we not? And I'm asking a question, and what's the answer? We make the decision on all of these, but you're correct. We make that decision, but... History in this district has been that it's been done the way that the motion is described. Okay. And if you take a look, the, the issue of the Act 10 issue was brought up before I wasn't separated out for that. Okay. So I don't know why it would apply in this case either. Uh, last year you were, <clears throat> you were separated out. No, I was Dr. not. I was the same with all the other administrators. <clears throat> I do recall there was a year that it was separate. I, and, you know, we can argue all we want, but I'm just, for the sake of the new person, there hasn't it been a year that I've been separated out from administrators since I've been here. So it could be separated out, doesn't necessarily have to be separated out, and Dr. Pats believed that last year it was not separated out. It hasn't been he for the last six years. For the last six years, okay. But it, it could have been. It could have been. Okay, thank you. Would it be reasonable for us to ask, or, or maybe you just do it, um, a follow-up as to how your uh, determinations with your directors. Oh, up. sure, absolutely. So it's 
so if we authorize this, we would know where it went. We, we've done that at any time we can do that. Like I said, it generally involves two to three people out of that entire group, if that. Is there any other discussion? Uh, we have an amendment, amended motion on the floor, Mo amend, amended motion by Mr. Nielsen. The second was by Melissa. Mrs. Klein. Mm -hmm. Two, <laughs> um, we'll have to say that motion again to uh, approve the 2.70% compensation with the pool. Which what it creates is the the pool of dollars to be uh, distributed at the discretion of, of superintendent. Dr. Pats. Non-represented employees. Uh, Non-certified non staff. Non-certified. Yeah, but I, well, all right. My motion was non-represented. Mm -hmm. But this is the amendment. Okay. So, uh, may I have a roll call, please? Mrs. Klein? This is just an amendment. Then right. I. Mrs. Larson? Aye. Mr. Nielsen? Aye. Mrs. Witkowski? Aye. I'll say yes, Mr. Alexandrovich? Aye. Mrs. Evans? No. Six to one. Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have the, the amendment. That was the amendment. You have to vote on the original motion. That was the amendment, yeah. That created the pool. Okay, then, um, well, the amendment, no, the amendment. The amendment is the a amendment separate motion. Over the no, it doesn't. You, you vote on each amendment separately, and then they have to go back to the original vote. So back to you. go and the motion is amended. He amended the, uh, the original motion. Which meant that it wasn't a 2.7 across the board for each individual. It was the two point, the, the sum amendment. of the 2.7s would create a pool of dollars that Dr. Pass has a discretion to. Correct, so how can you go back to the original motion? You made a new motion. That's what the amended, you amended the original motion. So now we have a 2.70 motion. You're right. The pool. You, you, you amended the motion, but you have to vote on an amendment separately from the original motion. You have to vote on each individual motion and, and oh. separately. So no, we're voting no, on the motion as amended, even though I understand right. what you're saying. It affected right. the it's pool. Right. I agree. Yeah. But you can't vote you on the original motion because it's not the same motion anymore. Right. It's amended. Right. So the original this amended is it. motion. But you, but you voted on the amendment. You still have to right. vote on the original motion. Correct. You have to vote on each item separately. That's been either a motion we're working or our way backwards. So we've approved oh, the, the amendment, but now we're going to vote on that amendment right. to see if that's because you changed the original okay. motion. Yep. But it, I understand. It sounds like Janet's saying that we passed the 2.7 percent. Yeah. We just passed the 2.7 percent. Right. We did. It's done. No, we, no, we, we did. did. We, we voted on amending that yeah. motion yeah. to put that forward. That amendment. We so we're voting on the original point. motion of 2.70 percent for it. Correct. All I did was for the stipulate the fact that it wouldn't be Mrs. individually attached. It would create. Okay. But Mrs. Klein, of Mrs. Klein's motion, seconded by Mrs. Larson for, <clears throat> and you're calling it non-represented, which is the same as non-certified, though, correct? Right. Yes. Maybe have a roll call, please. Mrs. Wachowski? No. <coughs> Mr. Alexandrovich? Yes. Mrs. Evans? No. Mr. Nielsen? Yes. Mrs. Klein? Yes. Mrs. Larson? Aye. I'll say yes. Two zero. Or I'm sorry, two five. <laughs> Motion carries. Thank you. Now the personnel report, please. Well, you have the personnel report. Um, there are um, three hires listed there, two of which I'm very pleased to announce are tech, tech ed teachers, which are very hard to hire. Um, the third is um, an individual who would help coordinate the program that you heard about um, this evening, but also teaches 50% of the time in our um, tech ed department. So 50% of her day is going to be to help build this program, and 50% of her day would uh, be teaching. 
And it should be pointed out, this stays, this stays within the allocation of the <coughs> staffing dollars that are available. We're just reallocating some positions. Yeah, I have a question about that. I, in your report last meeting, we're actually reducing tech ed 0.42. Right, we have some employees we're replacing. So, and there were, so these are just. Those are replacement employees. Or vacancies, I guess I didn't. Mm -hmm. See, how many vacancies do we have right now? I guess. Um, that's a good question. It's an increasing number. I would say um, 15. 15? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I know you always had retirements mm -hmm. on this report also. I don't remember. Yeah, These. we haven't. The retirees usually come in February because that's when they have to give us notice. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, we, we have about 15 vacancies. I'd be happy to provide the board with information about those vacancies. And people are moving to other places to live. Um, and that's happened more recently. So some contracts were just for one year, but um, this would be a, our report for this evening. And I'd like to issue the contracts to these individuals. If I could <coughs> bring up something, uh, I know I had asked for this before and it really helped. Um, when we have these higher reports, if you could include put in there uh, replaces, maybe not the name, but maybe oh, just yes. replacement hire yes. or new hire. Okay. And then we had them on some before, and I didn't even think about it until Linda just brought it up now. That would be nice. Sure, I'll then put we'd... those back in again. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Are these tech ed um, teachers specialists in particular areas? I know that you did provide Linda with the list of all of the, t the tech ed, but I, mm -hmm. you know, some of these skill sets are really specialized. Yeah, some of them are, but uh, frankly, um, you know, they're, they're, they can move into other areas. For example, um, Seth is able to do autos, but he also can do construction. So. Um, we're pretty fortunate when we find that. Um, so are they certified then? Mm -hmm. Just in technical education, their experience, like you said, bottles, whatever, is just... Kind of an area of specialization. Um, Mike yeah. knows a lot about that as well, working with them. Yeah, you're right. In fact, we're, um, there's some recent discussion about s doing a separation like you're talking about, but typically a tech ed teacher has, can teach construction, manufacturing, auto, any any one of them um, but you're also right in that they may have had experience in one even though they're certified in, in others so there's you know. only one certification technically ed, yep which can mean I was just amazed at the uh, range of uh, courses right. courses that they can teach right it'd be it'd be more creative to and help us you know have people come from industry and pick up a teaching certification if it were just in one area. Um, and that's an idea that we talked about at CISA 1, but that we're not there now. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All right, thank you. Item 9, board meeting debriefing. Are there any comments? Do we need to approve that? Yeah, need to approve the person report. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the personnel report as I'll, listed? I'll make that motion. Motion by Mrs. Larson. Is there a second? A second. Second by Mrs. Schleter. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the personnel report say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. And item 9, board meeting debriefing. Aye. <coughs> I'd like to start again, and just by, and I don't want to mean to nitpick on this, Steve, but under reports it says non-certified staff compensation update and personnel report approval. And so I was looking, and we had the approval attachment, I was looking to approve the attachment and get an update from Judy on what's going on with the certified staff compensation. And so I felt when that was brought before us, that that was a little unfair. We'll so that's my opinion. Hmm? We'll clarify it next time. I would appreciate that. Um, I think that we, d we did a nice job tonight of um, keeping our conversation on the issues at hand and keeping personal things out of it. Um, so I'd just like to make that comment. And I also, um, thought the personalized learning presentation was very impressive. That was the ton of information. And um, I was wondering if um, 
maybe Wendy, you're the right one to ask if could you, or maybe Steve, I don't know, could one of you ask Nick if he could provide us with a copy of, of Absolutely. his presentation? Sure. There was like too much to read and listen all at the same time. Yeah, I think if, yeah. if Megan could um, upload it to Board Docs, would that be appropriate, Steve? Sure. It'd okay. be a good thing to have in the library. Right. Put it in the library on Board Docs? Yeah. Okay. Be great. I think the quote on the night has to be Linda taking a drink out of a fire hose. That was pretty appropriate. There was a lot of information. And Nick talks fast. There's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of information. <laughs> um, and so, was that program be considered cutting edge or bleeding edge? <laughs> I'm going to throw it out there for administrators. <laughs> it, it's not as uncommon as you think. It just looks differently everywhere. Like right now, Muskego is running a program, and I can't think of what they call it. It's just, um, like Nick said, a little, it's a different twist to it. So you'll see um, school districts that are embracing the expectations come forward with something. Th this is this is a will be a rigorous program that will require a great deal of work and you can only do it if you have minds that are able to think it through and, and work through it so it's um, I wouldn't say it's bleeding edge I would say it's 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 cutting edge for us yeah and it's 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 the expectation though it's the work that has to be done there's there's a think tank called um, Next Generation Learning that has been put together and CISA 1 has been facilitating, some of that. Mm -hmm. facilitating it for about six districts. And so they've been asking districts to step forward and come up with a model. And um, the high school group was willing to take on the challenge and, and look at the I model. I first saw that model like two conventions ago or, and it was very fascinating. But I think when we change how we award credits, that's pretty Right, right. Yeah, edgy. And, and it, you still have to comply with all the DPI laws and regulations. Unfortunately, minutes, <coughs> or seat time, all of those things, um, you can ask for a waiver. But in, initially, you have to program within those requirements. You can't just disregard those at this point. So they have to work around some of those expectations. Mm -hmm. Was this the vision he was talking about a year ago, or was it? it I mean, because I didn't think it, anything. It goes like back this was two coming years. down the pike, right? Huh? It goes back two years, actually. Yeah, we mm -hmm. formulated him coming before the board uh, last year by a lot of discussions taking place. Uh, a lot of it came out of our administrative retreat, and then from there that built on a lot of things we did at Slate and some of those other places to to get to this point. As far as changing the clusters and mm -hmm. streamlining, streamlining that, that wasn't discussed a year ago. No. That was, that was it was formulation. an idea, but it wasn't developed at all. It was okay. getting us to that first yeah. level. Right, exactly. You, you saw the foundation pieces being built. We couldn't bring this before you if they didn't lay the foundation and do all the work that was done. But the very first uh, slogan that came out of it that you saw in that presentation as well as a year ago, it was above the red line. We, we had to, as a district, transition out of this basic memorization and those kinds of rote things that everybody can do for the <coughs> higher order thinking skills, critical analysis and evaluation, and that's where we're, we're headed now. That's very exciting. So. Okay, uh, future agenda items. We have the music review executive summary. What is that exactly? Executive summary. It's it's the you receive one at the end of every review. We we, we do it for all curricula. Compile areas. all okay. of the information so you understand the shifts around the review. Okay, thank you. On May twenty second, the district <coughs> technology update on May twenty second, the first draft of the 2013-2014 budget on June tenth, and then we have the uh, national school board convention conference update on June tenth. And I, I'd just like to say uh, we're going to be um, introducing a, a different format for that um, for conferences. That'll just be a, a short. More topical and not in depth. Pardon? More, More topical. topical. Yeah, just um, a written uh, a sheet that you can take with you to uh, conferences and then fill out. So it'll be more brief at meetings. And then we'll have a library on Ford Docs that. You can have your reports on there to read so the public can read them also. 
um, Dr. Patz was working on yeah, that. You'll today. be able to go online and, yeah. and fill it out. And if you go, like, for example, when, when I went to the last one, I went 12 sessions, well, I'm not going to write up yeah. on 12 yeah, sessions. I'm going to write up the top two, three, whatever it might be. Uh, Megan has got the form we gave to her today, and she'll put that up. So you, all you have to do is go on and fill it in, just type it in, and then that'll go into the board docs library. Oh, so we'll be getting that before June 10th. Then. It should be up and operational tomorrow, next week, soon. And then there's also a place if you want to put things in there to attach. You've gone somewhere and you had a pamphlet or a whatever, you can put that on there, and then that'll be in the board docs library. And then at the board meeting, you can just talk about maybe your favorite one that you went to instead, because otherwise we have maybe. 36 to talk about, and that can be so a little. The literary masterpiece I've been working on. I'm not. Well, yes, you can still. You can still talk about your so special that? presentation. Okay. Yes. yes. PowerPoint did you want? <laughs> and then uh, uh, the RTI update on June 10th. I'm working hard on it. Is the budget coming out June 10th? Is that early enough to have discussion? If there's issues. I mean, is it, it, it always come out this late? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I work on a budget, and we usually get it in people's hands two months before we need final approval, because there's always questions about budgets. Well, remember, for ours, we just originally seek preliminary approval so that we can begin our fiscal year July 1 uh, to spend money, basically, but it doesn't necessarily uh, affect the overall approval of the budget, which oh, isn't okay. until later on. That's the end of October. Final, final approval is the end of October, correct? As a matter of fact, Jim, I think when we had a conversation, you even mentioned that. Right. Sorry, I oh. fell asleep for just a second. <laughs> okay, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. A motion by Mr. Nielsen. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Alexandrovich. All those in favor say aye. Aye. aye.